Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm Ken White. This is uh, Eric Mill. Um, hopefully, everyone can hear us in the back. Um, uh, can, can, it, can everyone hear us in the back? Is everything good? We're good? All right, cool. <laughs> OK. Go ahead. Uh, sure, so just to introduce ourselves. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm Eric Mill. Uh, I work on TLS stuff and just web PKI uh, deployment and policy. And I've uh, been working on this stuff just even just in my personal capacity for, for a few different years um, and participate in Mozilla and, and Cab Form and stuff like that. So uh, my background before that was actually doing uh, transparency and open government work at a nonprofit here in DC. So I tend to have uh, kind of a different background than a lot of folks working in this, in this field and uh, a much more, much more uh, transparent view of, of how to approach things. Cool. Um, my background's kind of strange. I'm uh, formally trained as an engineer, but also in um, uh, mathematic models and uh, computational neuro. Uh, but I've been doing network security for, for many, many years. Um, and I guess most uh, relevant to this, uh, a couple years ago we started the Open Crypto uh, Audit Project. I'll talk about that a, a bit more in a, in a little bit. but. Um, one of the things that we're working on right now and, and about to release is, um, is an audit of the uh, new OpenSSL 1.1. And so uh, we'll, we'll give a brief recap of that at the end. But, but let's, uh, let's go ahead and dive into it. And hopefully we'll um, share some things and, and uh, we'll have enough time for Q&A at the end. But uh, really want to kind of dive into a lot of the history of, of TLS and sort of where the, where the current uh, state of practice is. So. Basic question, right? I mean, I think most of the people, if you're in the uh, information security world, you, you know, you know the basic answer to this. But um, fundamentally, HTTPS and TLS come down to making a few assurances. Um, the goal for um, for using the, these technologies are to assure confidentiality, uh, authenticity, and integrity. Um, just sort of on the basics. So confidentiality. If you see a a uh, really long uh, URL with lots of parameters, lots of question marks and ampersands. There's, uh, there's, I think people intellectually know that uh, TLS or previously SSL uh, sort of uh, hides that or provides confidentiality. But I think intuitively, I think sometimes when people see long URL strings, either in uh, you know proxies or load balancers or, or some other link, there's this notion that that you know, those data are through the, the system. And that's, that may be the case in logs, but it's definitely not the case in, at the transport layer. Um, I don't know if you want to speak about SNI. Sure. Well, uh, we'll talk a, a, quite a bit about SNI uh, later on. But <coughs> SNI is, is the idea that um, you, should have multiple, you can have multiple certificates uh, on, the, on one IP address. And right now, the only practical way to achieve that sort of thing um, is to, when the client is trying to connect to an IP address, specify the domain name whose certificate they're looking for the server to provide. So uh, in the era of server name indication in which we now live, uh, the domain name is, should be assumed to be exposed on the wire as well. Um, a, a key point, I'm going to spend a fair amount of time later talking about this, particularly with kind of uh, advice and suggestions for uh, ops people and kind of like, you know, bottom line, what, what, what are best practices? What, what should we be paying attention to? What are being deprecated, those sort of things. But authenticity comes up uh, in a big way. So modern authentication is, uh, or modern uh, encryption is authenticated. Um, it protects against impersonation. Uh, and we use some of these uh, techniques uh, to provide tamper resistance. So um, uh, uh, altering uh, the, the um, information that's coming or uh, impersonation. Uh, if you encrypt app data on your network but don't authenticate it, it's not your data. So there's, um, in, in the applied crypto security world, there's, there's a long history of the point at which data packets are signed. There's this notion of Mac then encrypt, encrypt then Mac, Mac and encrypt. The key point is that if data that are coming across the network are signed before they're encrypted, they're not authenticated. And so what does that mean? It means, in a, for example, in a browser context with uh, JavaScript or, or uh, WebSockets, uh, an, you know, a, uh, an attacker can change an admin 0 to equals admin 1, for example, in a, in a cookie uh, part of the data uh, uh, packet. 
So an example, there's, um, there's a project called ZeroDB um, that was released, uh, I guess, yeah, about a year ago or so, December. And uh, it has a lot of interesting technology. There's some really uh, sharp people that are working on it. Um, but one of the things that came up when they put their code on, uh, you know, out for review was there were sort of some uh, kind of unconventional ways uh, that, that some of the network transport was being done. And within, I think, like a day or two of it being released, this came up on, uh, on Reddit, and someone made the, the point that the way this particular uh, authentication was being done, you, you literally could do um, a, a very simple bit uh, manipulation, uh, a reversal, an XOR as it's called, um, and change whatever's in the cookie uh, token, uh, in this case, to uh, you know, whatever you'd like. Um, and so you know, they went in and fixed it and changed it. And so, but there's, there's a whole history of unauthenticated encryption um, that's really plagued a lot of ops people. It's, it's the reason for beast attacks, it's the reason for um, Poodle and some of these other, um, you know, some of these other known uh, SSL and TLS attacks that we'll talk about in just a bit. Uh, integrity. Actually, I think this is your screenshot, right? Uh, yeah. Well, so this is this is a screenshot from me taking a Southwest Airlines flight. So, um, you know, it, this as an example, right? So if you're if you're on a network uh, and if you're using a plain HTTP connection, right? So that that data can just be modified in transit, really by anybody with a network vantage point, right? So this is on on plain Wi-Fi, and they're really helpful. They're trying to be helpful and just tell you your flight status. Uh, and they're just kind of injecting it <laughs> into the top of, uh, of your browser. And if you were to like, view source on this, uh, you would see that actually there's a whole bunch of JavaScript that's been, uh, and HTML that's been inserted uh, into the top of the HTML that was originally served by chromium.org. Uh, chromium.org, also you can access it over HTTPS, and if you do so on the same network, there is no flight tracker being injected because it's not possible f even for the network that you're connected to to do that sort of thing. Um, so uh, you know that's a, that's an example where integrity you know where the service is trying to be helpful to you, um, but you can certainly imagine that it's not always a helpful thing that people are trying to inject uh, information into your traffic, uh, and really when it really gets down to it, uh, if you use plain HTTP on a website like this, you, you, your privacy policy and your terms of service start meaning a lot less, right? Because because you no lo you've lost control over what is actually happening, what third parties are in, are end up being in use um, on your website. So uh, it really integrity. A, a lot of the time, the focus on TLS and HTTPS now focuses a lot on privacy uh, and surveillance concerns. Um, but it's really important to understand that the integrity guarantees that you get are of massive security value, and that without it, you really have lost control over the situation entirely. Right. So yeah, talk a little bit about uh, the, so there's, there's been a, a, just a ton of momentum over the past couple of years in a whole bunch of different corners on making the web HTTPS by default, um, has massive technical and political ramifications. Um, so some history about it. Uh, way back in the day, like right back in 2010, uh, is was starting to be right about the time you were seeing like some major tech companies start to make serious investments in HTTPS. Uh, and, and specifically, not just on the login screen. I mean, people have, people have done HTTPS for login screens since you know, the 90s, um, but it's a much newer thing for people to actually just default this across their website, even once logged in. Um, there was a pretty big, uh, you can go on to the next slide. Um, yeah, so in 2010, there was a really big deal around uh, Firesheep around 2009, 2010, which was a way of hijacking session cookies that led a lot of companies to start just uh, using encryption across the board, even after login. Um, in the modern day, there's, there are other interesting attacks that uh, have been perpetrated on HTTP traffic. So as an example of uh, an integrity concern, um, this was uh, a program that uh, Verizon ran, I think from 20, starting 2012, discovered in 2014, or at least made massively public in 2014 and uh, ran until earlier this year. Um, so this is, it, it still does, but so in this, in this, in this program, uh, basically all HTTP traffic, at least much HTTP traffic on Verizon's network, um, they would actually inject a HTTP header uh, into that traffic, um, the header is x-uidh, um, they would just give it a temporary ID. And that's essentially, it's a cookie for all intents and purposes, 
And it basically allows user activity to be tracked across sessions, uh, even, even if cookies are cleared or not allowed to be stored, that sort of thing. So it essentially gives uh, Verizon, as an ISP, just a tremendous amount of data about their users' browsing activity across different sessions, and that gives them data they can then sell to advertisers and other things. So they were just doing this silently uh, without any opt-in whatsoever to user traffic on Verizon. Uh, so if you go to the next one, uh, now, here in 2016, uh, regulatory action, uh, we, so we actually have this, this uh, has now been punished, right? so there's a, a very serious fine in the millions of dollars uh, that the FCC has assessed from Ver Verizon for this practice, um, as it, as, and as they now move it and have been ordered to make it opt-in uh, as part of the, the overall uh, settlement that uh, Ver Verizon reached with the FCC. Um, so that's actually a really important case of a program that really relied on the fact that the web is mostly unencrypted. Um, because it's not like the web has to get to 100% encryption to make a program like that not useful or viable. You, like, you really just have to get it to the point where even if you did set up such a program, you would really not get very much of interest. It would not be useful to you and not be worth your money to do it. But because the internet has traditionally been so unencrypted, this, this sort of program was completely viable and useful to do. Uh, another integrity concern, so there is in early 2015, there is this, this event that happened called, uh, that started getting referred to as the Great Cannon Attack. Uh, it was very evocative. Um, the, uh, what's, what's the name, Citizen Lab, uh, which is a, a sort of academic uh, group of researchers that uh, looks into internet censorship and other activities, uh, documented this attack where basically GitHub had a, just a massive Massive DDoS attack rendered against them one day. So GitHub was, was basically down for like an afternoon. It was very obvious. Um, and the way that that was done was it took uh, traffic to a service called Baidu Analytics. So Baidu is sort of a competitor to Google that lives in China. And so requests to Baidu Analytics, much like requests have traditionally been to Google Analytics, were mostly unencrypted. So it was mostly plain HTTP requests to the Baidu Analytics JavaScript. So what was happening is that a network the size of China, uh, if you were inside that network, then you visited some website, it doesn't matter what it is, they, you know, they don't have to have an affiliation with Baidu, but they happen to use Baidu Analytics as a product, tries to pull in the JavaScript file. That JavaScript file had the network inject additional code into it that then caused that browser to just start pinging GitHub on a while loop. Right, that's, that's really basic stuff, actually. Uh, but that was really effective at uh, sending a, just a massive DDoS attack at GitHub, and specifically on a couple of URLs that GitHub hosted uh, that were hosting anti-censorship, like get around firewalls type of materials. Um, so it's honestly pretty surprising that such a obvious event, like, but that's just clearly that's not going to like be not noticed. But that was, that was perpetrated, and, and a big part of that was just a basic HTTP traffic injection of code that weaponized the browsers of people who were visiting. Could have been anything. They could have been visiting, you know, a, just some random blog. Could be somebody's little store. It could just. It could literally be any website that happens to use an analytics JavaScript uh, file. So really important to understand that stuff. There is also evidence that there's malicious injection that can be detected um, at, at levels sort of beyond just like the ISPs that you personally sign up for, right? So you have a relationship as a user, as a citizen, or, or, or whatever, as a resident, uh, with Verizon, with AT&T, with Comcast, with RCN. Uh, but there's a lot of other networks out there that are more corporate-facing and that also serve to essentially peer and connect different user-facing networks together. It's like, uh, you know, uh, their names are harder to summon off the top of my head because they're not user-facing, but like I think level one is, is one of them. Um, and so there's, there is, there's observed activity where network injection is just occurring somewhere on the big bad internet, like at the backbone level or just like outside of the visible level of user-facing ISPs. And some of that is injecting things like ads. But they've, this, this particular paper, the researchers even observed some cases of malicious injected content, right? So this all is part of like this changing assumption that the network, the network should be treated as hostile. Right, that you just you have no control over what happens between anybody's browser and your website, or your browser and anybody's website. So the only way to behave in that kind of an environment is just to encrypt everything all the time. And fortunately, HTTPS makes that relatively easy. 
So because of all this stuff, like you, you, you see some actually sweeping actions. So Mozilla has announced that they're deprecating non-secure HTTP. It's kind of actually a vague uh, thing to say, but they, the way that they've started actually like making that actionable is uh, by looking at, essentially as new features come out and as existing powerful features exist, um, to start just making those HTTPS only, uh, right? And so, so now every time there's a new feature that comes out, um, or, or in the case of existing features like geolocation uh, or web VR just coming out, like every feature now gets subject to this review of like, maybe this should be a feature that only HTTPS websites can use. Or maybe this existing feature like geolocation is inherently sending sensitive data and should be HTTPS only. And that's the sort of thing that really makes people move around. Very recently, this is just a few weeks ago, um, Google has been saying for a while that they would start doing something like this. So they're actually finally starting to affirmatively mark certain pages as not secure, right? And so I, I wish these were less common, but the thing that they're starting with are HTTP pages that have password or credit card form fields. Now, it's important to note that these password or credit card form fields could be posting to an HTTPS URL, but if the page that the form is delivered over is also insecure, you really don't get a lot of strong guarantees, or really any at all, that the form itself hasn't been tampered with. So this actually is, is fairly common, and so uh, Chrome is gonna start, they've just recently changed their icon, so their lock icon is, is newer, and now instead of showing mixed content warnings, they show an information thing. Um, they're actually gonna start showing the words not secure, uh, which is really gonna stand out, uh, and that's, that's pretty new for any browser to do. Uh, there's also, Folks, maybe folks have heard of this. There's, there's a new certificate authority. It's a nonprofit. Uh, the nonprofit's name is the Internet Security Research Group. Uh, it runs a CA called Let's Encrypt, funded by a combination of companies and, and nonprofits. Um, and this certificate authority just gives out free certificates to anyone who can prove control over a domain name. Right? So they, it's all API driven. They just give out free 90 day certificates. The API favors renew automation and, re and automatic renewal. And these, uh, you know, and they're audited to the same web standards as everybody else. Uh, and that's a, now that's something that you have available to you, and that was never previously there. And uh, there was never a free CA that was easy to automate, uh, where you could just just turn it into something that's essentially just a protocol guarantee with no business or money exchanging going on. Uh, also, there is, in fact, the, the U.S. government, the, the White House Office of Management and Budget, has an executive policy these days, issued in June of last year, that just tells every executive agency, uh, HTTPS only, and strict transport security, which we'll talk about later, uh, for anything that's public on the public internet that is run by a federal agency. And that is, that is really important. Uh, that has an associated website with it, with rationale, with a whole bunch of like, helpful migration material, and uh, policy sets a deadline of the end of uh, a few months from now, end of December 31st of this year. So the federal government's going through a big migration to be HTTPS only, which is also just a really interesting problem. So talk a little bit about strict transport security. Um, strict transport security is, I think, um, just one of the most important, it, it's a, a very simple thing that, that from a technical perspective uh, adds a couple of things, but from a HTTPS migration perspective is extremely important. So strict transport security basically is trying to compensate for the fact that the web has, is mostly not encrypted. Right? And so because the web is mostly not uh, encrypted, right now if you go into your browser and you just type, you know, uh, well I'll try to use a not strict transport example. Um, I don't know, if you type in AOL.com, like your browser assumes that you mean HTTP colon slash slash AOL.com, right? It doesn't try HTTPS first. And because of that, uh, that's, not, that's not very good, right? So if a domain doesn't have strict transport security, you type that in, you go to it, you're hopefully gonna get redirected to a secure site, like, and, so, and the site can redirect people to a secure connection, <clears throat> but the redirect itself is not secure. Um, with strict transport, you're basically giving permission. So if I set HSTS, if I set a strict transport security policy I, uh, for a particular domain name, then uh, you're saying that, uh, that, that basically you're giving browsers permission to always assume HTTPS. And it's not just when you type in the URL into your browser and hit enter, but even if you go and like, you click a, an HTTP link that somebody's put in there, or even if you just paste in HTTP colon slash slash whatever and hit enter, your browser will do an internal redirect. So your browser will say, oh, I already know it's strict transport. 
I'm just going to redirect to HTTPS before I ever reach out to the network at all. And you can see that in DevTools. Actually, I think that's the next slide. Oh, no, it's, it's not. But uh, you can see that in DevTools in Chrome or Firefox that if strict transport is set, you will do that. Um, strict transport also has this other benefit of, of just disallowing the click-through of certificate warnings. Right? So this allows your website to opt into a, just a much, to hard fail, to uh, a much stricter uh, setting. And this can have profound ramifications for, there, there are in fact different parts of the world and uh, you know, in different you know, government entities and stuff that kind of rely on people to be able to click through certificate warnings sometimes in different parts of, parts of their website, which is not good. Um, so I, you know, I actually I realize I, what I don't have a slide, I don't, what I don't have is a slide actually showing the strict transport security header. So I'll just describe it. Uh, which is that if you want to set strict transport security for a domain, um, you need to just send down an HTTP header, uh, which is strict-transport-security, with, um, with basically a, with a max age of whatever many seconds you want the client to cache it for. So basically after the, the browser visits a website for the first time and it sees that strict transport security header, the browser is allowed to remember that for however many seconds the website tells it to. And so uh, so a lot of folks will pick a time of like a year, for example. So uh, you'll visit my website for the first time, and I'll t my website will tell the browser, I insist that my website be HTTPS only for a year. And then every time you visit the website going forward, it'll renew itself, so as long as you visit once a year, it'll always be in place. Um, so that's still not perfect, because it doesn't cover the first visit. Um, and there's some other edge cases where like you can still kind of like not have that in effect the way you want to. So there's... Uh, the Chrome team started this out, and now it's actually in every browser, uh, every major browser that you would probably ever use, uh, is this thing called the HSTS preload list. So it literally is a list of domain names that gets hard-coded into browsers as HTTPS only. And you know, maybe that doesn't scale to, ho to hold the entire internet, uh, but it, it's, it's got many thousands of domains in it now. I think it's up to like 16 or 20,000. And you'll notice that it also has this thing called include subdomains. So if you want to get your thing onto the preload list, um, it's very easy to do. You have your root domain, https colon slash slash domain dot com. You set a strict transport header for at least a year, and or for at least th three months, I think. And then you, s you say include subdomains, and then you say the word preload to indicate that you're fine being preloaded. And then you just hit the button in the form, and as long as it meets those conditions, it will add you to this list, and your domain name will get hard-coded into Chrome in the next release. Uh, and because this is such a good idea, uh, this is actually now in Firefox, Internet Explorer 11, Edge, Opera, Safari, and Fire I said Firefox already. Um, so this is actually something where you could just be HTTPS only, hard-coded in every major browser. Uh, and that's, that's a relatively recent development. All right, so I guess I'll talk a little bit about certificate transparency. We'll get to some, some of Ken's sections uh, pretty soon. Um, so, I want to talk, so certificate transparency is, is this idea um, that, well, it's, it's what it sounds like. It is the idea of publishing every publicly trusted certificate. And it's meant to address uh, the, a bunch of weaknesses in the web PKI that have been driving everybody crazy for a long time. Right? So this is a graph uh, that's trying to show all the different CAs that are trusted in the world and their intermediates, and uh, it's, I, don't, I honestly don't even really know what the size of the circles here mean. The point is that there's just a ton of CAs, right? So if you go, if you open up your Mac and you look in like your certificate store, or your keychain rather, uh, and you, you click through the things, you'll see like you have a list of uh, many dozens or you know, maybe over 100 uh, root certificates that are issued by different certificate authorities. And any of those certificate authorities, technic from a technical perspective, can issue a certificate that's valid for any domain, and your browser will trust it, and your operating system will trust it. Uh, and, it and it gets a bit more complicated for intermediaries. There right. are about 4,900 uh, intermediaries that are trusted in Firefox and IE as of a couple of years ago. Right, and so these all chain up to, I mean, there's, a, there's, there's <coughs> these roots are all subject to, uh, well, they're subject to a bunch of technical requirements. They're subject to be audited, and Mozilla, Microsoft, Apple, uh, I mean, Adobe even, uh, Oracle. Everybody who basically man has any sort of platform where roots are bundled together and shipped 
uh, you know, keeps, keeps they, they have requirements, but nonetheless, like this is still a big surface area um, that's pretty problematic. So certificate transparency is, is it was a, a Google creation, so Google designed it, um, and it's currently only implemented in any vigorous way inside Chrome, although I, there's, at this point, there's other work happening in other browsers. Um, and certificate transparency has a few different kind of legs to it. So the, the, the simplest one, and the one that is, is the most closely associated, is just the idea of these logs. So you can run a certificate transparency log, and all these logs can be queried by anybody at any time. So this is crt.sh. Uh, it's a nice open source uh, certificate transparency viewer. Right, so this is a search in it for WashingtonPost.com, and you can just see all the certs that have ever been seen, <coughs> that have ever been logged for WashingtonPost.com. Um, there's even an RSS feed. You could just subscribe if, if that's what you really wanted to do. Maybe the Washington Post security team should do that. Um, right, so certif certificate transparency in part is, is meant to be this tool for domain owners to track like who is issuing certificates for their domain so they can see if like some CA they have no relationship with suddenly issued a certificate for their domain. So that uh, requires, you know, to really get that kind of guarantee, you actually need certificate authorities to all be required to publish things as certificate transparency. And that's not the case. Um, but even without that being a requirement yet, there have been, there, there are many millions of log certificates, in part because there are a few CAs, like Let's Encrypt, that voluntarily submit, uh, and also because Basically, there's tons of internet scanning devices and services that will just scan the internet and take any certificate they find and just shove it into a certificate transparency log. So there's actually a lot of visibility already into certificates in the web PKI. Uh, Google recently, this is about a year ago, uh, noticed that Symantec, uh, had, there was a, a certificate and certificate transparency <coughs> for Google.com that Google had not issued. So that caused Google some concern, and they asked Symantec what was up with that. And Symantec published a report that's like, okay, here's what went wrong. We apologize. We had some control failures in our test environment. Our bad. And then Google went and looked through the certificate transparency logs again and found more certificates that Symantec hadn't found. And they're like, this is screwed up. And so to, they just publicly punished Symantec for that. And the way that they punished them was to say, uh, we're going to require in Chrome that uh, you log all of your certificates in certificate transparency logs and that you abide by Chromium certificate transparency policy. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, right, uh, this is another example where uh, Facebook uh, had a blog post like, wow, like certificate transparency helped us out. Like we found a certificate that we didn't think we had issued. Um, it turns out that um, it wasn't a misissuance. It was one of their teams inside Facebook or like a contractor or somebody like used a CA that by Facebook's internal corporate policy they should not have done. So Facebook's central team wasn't expecting it, but it wasn't a misissuance. But still, they found it through certificate transparency because Let's Encrypt has been voluntarily publishing. So because Chrome is now requiring certificate transparency for Symantec, you can actually see like new warnings that you've never seen in browsers before. Uh, you can see a certificate transparency warning. Um, and so this, was, this, is, this works fine now, but for a while, Chase Bank had a website where they'd gotten a certificate from Symantec that hadn't been logged, so, uh, or hadn't been logged properly, at least. So you would get a certificate warning, and you would either have to click through it or, or whatever. Uh, and that's, that's a new development, and that, you know, it'll be interesting to see where stuff goes from here and, and how that works out for them. But that's, that's a very active and growing part of the web PKI right now. So talking a little bit about um, some new, so, so a lot of folks when they're hosting websites, you could still, obviously you could still host a website on your own, but now a lot of websites are, are hosted behind uh, CDNs, uh, you know, things like Akamai or CloudFront or Cloudflare. Um, but so whether you're, on your, whether you're on a CDN, and because if you're on a CDN, they're the outermost layer, so they're gonna be providing the TLS connections, or if you're hosting it yourself, um, you should know about some like modern stuff that you can do. Um, the biggest one right now is, it, or like one of, one of the most important things to understand right now is server name indication, um, because it's, it's changing kind of how costs move around the CDN ecosystem, right? So server name indication is, is as I explained before, uh, the ability to host multiple uh, certificates on an IP address. So if you think about what that means, and also how limited and expensive IPv4 addresses are today, uh, that actually has a really profound impact on the cost of hosting 
uh, multiple websites. <coughs> and especially if you're a CDN provider and you host kajillions of websites and you want to be able to coalesce those into a smaller number of IPs, then you have to be able to support server name indication. Uh, however, server name indication uh, is, that was finalized, I think, in like 2003 or something, around there, but Windows XP never shipped it. Uh, so Windows XP and I think some early versions of Android and then also Python 2 for most until very recently uh, did not support server name indication. So for a long time, if you were just like a company who couldn't afford to cut off all XP users, you were not able to take advantage of server name indication. That also means that a lot of CDNs just basically didn't even bother offering server name indication for a long time. But now we're actually at a point where Windows XP usage and other legacy clients are to a low enough point and this is the case now, probably wasn't really the case two or three years ago, um, you can act most places can actually use server name indication now. And so, I'm sorry, if you just go back to the web, that slide. I'm sorry. Uh, so, for example, on Amazon CloudFront, if you're willing to turn on SNI for uh, your website, it goes from $600 a month to $0 a month <coughs> as to, to for, as, for what the add-on cost is of using a certificate. Right? So that's, that's a pretty major change. Uh, if you look at Cloudflare, uh, their universal SSL plan, which is the free plan, uh, and, and requires SNI. So if you are comfortable using server name indication, you can use, you don't have, to, you may not have to go to like the hugely expensive plan. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about HTTP2, which is another thing I think that folks aren't as broadly aware of as they should be. HTTP2 does two things uh, that are relevant to this session. Um, so well, generally speaking, HTTP2 is literally the next version of HTTP. Like HTTP 1.1 got finalized like 15 years ago, or no, 1999, and then HTTP 2.0 got finalized in 2015. So like a 16-year gap where people just didn't work on HTTP, um, or at least there were no final updates, right? So uh, HTTP2 has some massive performance benefits because it allows you to efficiently pipeline multiple connections to the same host name and IP address through like a single held open TCP connection. So a lot of things that people are used to doing for websites around pipelining and using like sharded asset domains like assets one, assets two, assets three, and spriting where you put one image with a ton of images inside it and then just kind of slide it around the viewport. Like all that stuff are crazy hacks that HTTP, HTTP2 renders unnecessary. And what's important for this session is that HTTP2 uh, requires the latest version of TLS, which is 1.2, and requires server name indication. So that's just improving the ecosystem and helping ensure that new, uh, that new protocols that are necessary are there. And then also, if, if you take a look at how browsers have actually implemented HTTP2, uh, they, it essentially requires encryption to use HTTP2. So the, the formal working group in SPAC wasn't able to agree that HTTPS should be required to use HTTP2, but in practice, uh, Chrome only ships HTTP2 for HTTPS connections. Uh, so far, as far as anybody could tell, Microsoft and Apple have done the same thing. Um, Firefox has basically done the same thing. They have an interesting alternative called opportunistic encryption uh, that lets you use unauthenticated encryption over HTTP2, but that's sort of an edge case. And in practice, you just need to use HTTPS to get this and to get performance benefits. So there are, We've talked about a lot of sticks, right? There's a lot of sticks to try to use HTTPS, but it's also nice to have a carrot uh, in the form of HTTP2 uh, to help speed up your website. Yeah, some of the benchmarks on this show, like 10 to 1, uh, you know, speed improvement. Yeah, it uh, depends for, on the character of your website and, what, and how it works, but it can really make a, ma a massive improvement. Okay, um, let's do a little bit of a deep dive. Um, Hopefully we've got enough time for this. All the material and all the links are on the uh, slides that we'll, we'll put up later. Um, so let's talk about interop and trade-offs. Why don't we just switch everyone to TLS 1.3, uh, 1.2, uh, require the latest Chrome, you know, uh, latest version of Windows 10, et cetera. Well, uh, because the world's a complicated place, so, and it's misunderstood. This is a, if people know the American Enterprise Institute, it's a, it's a really well-respected think tank in DC. Um, I thought this article was sort of interesting. The title was, how data encryption helps terrorists, but if you, <coughs> excuse me, actually look at it in your browser, um, this was your connection to www.ai.org is encrypted using a modern cipher suite. The connection uses TLS 1.2, the connection is encrypted and authenticated using AES 128 GCM, excellent, and uses uh, elliptic curve, Diffie-Hellman, 
uh, looked at Curve DSA as a key exchange. They actually uh, got some uh, feedback on that, and so they changed the name of the story and sort of expanded the, the essay a bit, but the, uh, the, the tag at the top for the, for the link stayed the same anyway. I thought that was kind of funny. Um, as we mentioned earlier, uh, Peter Bowen's one of the folks on uh, the Amazon's uh, PKI team. Uh, so this was a couple years ago, but, it, but it, it goes to the point that there are an enormous number of trust relationships that exist in most shipped in products, whether that's browsers, um, often the case with uh, load balancers or other network gear. Um, I've got the link here, um, but Ivan Ristic, if you know the uh, SSL Labs uh, site, which is just a, a fantastic resource and, and, uh, and work for the community, um, has a whole sort of threat model on different aspects of, of SSL and TLS and um, what assurances can be made. It's, it's worth a look. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's fast forward. You're an ops person. You've got a web server. You've got an API endpoint. You've got a middleware, JBoss, whatever. And your question is sort of like, all right, what's the current developed practice? One of the problems with TLS, and it's been the, in SSL, and it's been the case for years, is there are dangerously many options, right? There are just a, 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 you know, a mind-boggling array of configurations and settings and defaults. Um, I think the defaults on most uh, current distros are getting smarter and better and uh, safer, but you know the the tail is very long in the enterprise, right? I mean, so the 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 the, the Debians and the Red Hats and the uh, in some cases even the Amazon uh, you know Linux AMIs they they may be frozen for quite a while. Um, also, just a, a quick note on the the message authentication codes or, or hashes. Um, we're not going to be talking about passwords, but, but one of the things that if you read some of the background or kind of do a little bit of a deeper dive, there's a lot of misunderstanding about passwords in, in HMAX or digest codes. Um, one of the takeaways is for network encryption, authenticating hashes have to be very, very fast. A hash algorithm that's used in, uh, you know, in storing a password has to be very, very slow. So it's, uh, you know, there are... There are purposes and there are constructions that, that vary greatly depending on what the purpose is. Um, and so in 2016, with sort of standard enterprise OS workloads, these are probably your best options. And so some of the takeaways are SHA-1 and uh, MD5 have been deprecated, so we're moving to SHA-2. Uh, RSA key exchanges, not RSA certificates, but RSA key exchanges have been deprecated in 1.3. You cannot do RSA key exchange in TLS 1.3. Um, TLS 1.1 has some issues, uh, but it's going to be here for a long time. There's a lot of Android clients. There's a lot of endpoints. There's a lot of load balancers. There's tons of, uh, you know, older browsers, and Windows 7 is going to be here for, for, for quite some time. There are some known flaws in TLS 1.1, but they're mostly fixable at the client level. Um, we can talk a bit more about that if you'd like. Um, uh, right. And so... And again, these are sort of, if you launched a VM or stood up a web service API endpoint today, these are likely the tools you most likely have. <coughs> if you launch an Edge or development VM or OS and you stood up a web service endpoint today, you might have some of these other options. And so let's talk about that a bit. So Diffie-Hellman, everybody pretty familiar with Diffie-Hellman. The static key Diffie-Hellman key exchange is actually uh, considered deprecated. Um, it's going to be there for a while, um, but it's, it, I think we're sort of at the point now where a lot of security engineers and uh, cryptography engineers are saying, yeah, let's, let's sort of consider this in the, you know, the, the sunset phase. Uh, and so there are different aspects of uh, the, the uh, constructions of, of network encryption. We don't have a whole lot of great choices right now. We basically have GCM and CBC. Uh, there are some new protocols that use um, OCB. Um, but, but really, this is, uh, uh, some of these are really for, for edge and just sort of you know, cutting edge kind of uh, current things. Um, ChaCha20 is a, a stream cipher, I should mention, by the way. It's, it's sort of a much uh, better modern uh, replacement in, in some cases for, the, for RC4. Um, the padding abuses that we saw with the Beast and Poodle and 
uh, you know, a lot of the classic uh, TLS and SSL uh, protocol attacks in the recent years, they don't apply to ChaCha um, because it is an authenticated encryption. Um, and 1.3 is still, uh, TLS 1.3 is still uh, being tweaked, um, but Cloudflare has done some rollouts, uh, rollouts of it, and I think Chrome actually supports, uh, you know, some, sort of some experimental features of it. Um, but I want to emphasize this. So for years, we've been relying on CBC, which is a, it's a, uh, if you're not using a stream cipher, if you're using block mode encryption, um, it's kind of been the only game in town. The problem is, um, it, it has a history. Um, this is a, a great paper. I recommend everybody take a look at it. Just it's a it's a uh, a really practical sort of um, history of uh, a lot of the protocol attacks that, uh, in many cases, came from the CBC um, uh, constructions. So SSL three and TLS one zero are fundamentally broken. Um, they're broken because of protocol bugs and implementation flaws with CBC. CBC implementations are almost never abuse or um, misuse resistant. They almost beg to be um, constructed in the wrong way. <coughs> so again, not just the cipher suites, um, not just the authentication modes, but with um, certificate pinning, with strict transport security, with certificate transparency, SNI, um, the, the, ecosy the ecosystem of, of TLS um, you know, has advanced quite a bit. And, uh, there's, there's active work that's going on, particularly with the certificate transparency uh, that opens up um, the history of potential abuses or misissuances. The uh, didn't read version of this, uh, most of it has an SSL uh, configuration generator. Our general advice is if you can do it, if, you're, if your um, deployment model makes it possible, use Cloudflare, use AWS, Google, Azure endpoints, uh, CloudFront, a CDN. But if you have to roll your own gear, um, this is a great uh, tool in terms of uh, putting the, the, the very specific uh, configurations in place. Um, I've got a couple other links, and, and um, these are in the, the handouts as well. Um, there is, um, there's just so many great resources on uh, Ivan Ristic's uh, uh, work from the, the Qualsys SSL labs. Uh, really take, uh, recommend you take a look at it. Uh, he's written a, a great book called uh, Bulletproof SSL and TLS. If, you, if you're curious about how all this stuff actually plays out in, in sort of you know, real time, um, the people who run kind of the OCaml project have this Open Mirage project. And it's awesome because you can, you can click through and it's literally back and forth each step in the TLS protocol. You can navigate to the site and it's from your browser to them and you can sort of play back and forth. But it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a great illustration. Um, Adam Langley uh, is one of the core security engineers on the Chrome team. Uh, at Google and, and working with uh, the Golang project. Um, this is a, a great post that he wrote on uh, primitive strength matching. I recommend people take a look at that. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the uh, config generator. Uh, Scott Helm is considered one of the uh, sort of experts too in, in TLS configuration. He's got a nice post up on Windows TLS configs too for sort of modern, you know, how do you get sort of an A plus uh, kind of rating um, on Windows. Uh, and then if you are interested in the, the sort of they're not newer, but they're newer in terms of deployment percentages. I think I'm seeing like three to five percent uh, outside the CDN space uh, for ECDSA certificates. Uh, and then quickly, um, just wanted to uh, yeah, sort of dive into uh, the OpenSSL one audit. Um, I'm not sure folks are, are widely aware of it, but just a sort of a quick background. So. Um, we were commissioned, uh, we were approached by the Linux Foundation actually about two years ago, there's a few months after Heartbleed, um, and they said, let's, let's take a look at OpenSSL. Let's, let's really do a top to bottom kind of review. Uh, and so the people with, uh, you know, who've been involved with the Open Crypto Audit Project, Matt Green and, um, and folks on the advisory board, uh, talked about it and looked at it and said, okay, all right, this is hugely ambitious, but you know, this is important. Uh, OpenSSL has, a huge code base. It's, it's a complex piece of software. Um, this is probably one of the more ambitious uh, projects in, in network uh, security uh, in recent years. So here are the top line goals. Um, really want to do a public security analysis of the core code in the next major release. Um, demonstrate kind of the viability of open source test harnesses because it doesn't, it doesn't benefit anyone to do you know, a, a big assessment and then sort of have a 
you know, a big printed board, uh, you know, a report that's there and then you're done. What's really useful is are there, are there techniques or approaches or tools that we could develop that could be working with not just OpenSSL but potentially other uh, SSL crypto libraries? And then, uh, again, we wanted to put some things in, in peer review and some data sets for, um, you know, for other researchers. <coughs> um, I guess before I even get into this, one of the questions we get all the time is why OpenSSL? You know, there's lots of options. Because it's everywhere. It's on your phone right now. If you've got an Android or <laughs> you've got uh, an iPhone, it's running on your phone. It's on endpoints. It's on VPNs. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's everywhere. Uh, and so uh, when the OpenSSL team decided to do sort of a major refactor uh, a couple years ago, they put out some goals, and these are these are this is a major refactor. So they overhauled big num. So if you know if you're doing large prime integer math, you can't just use a 64-bit integer. These are these are really really large integers. Um, the things that are put in place in terms of blinding and constant time, um, those uh, mitigations were were updated. The file compositions, the file functions through the bio layer was updated. ASN and X509, the, the key pieces that handle um, parsing certificates and the dependency chains, major rework on that. Um, we used a corpus of 93 million uh, uh, certificates out in the wild. And I don't know if people are familiar with this, but it's, uh, it's worth looking up. There's a, there was a paper a couple years ago from, I think, a group at Stanford and then uh, Texas Austin called Frankenserts. And what they did is, they, they just abused and like, you know, really manipulated certificates in every possible way they could. And not surprisingly, almost every SSL and TLS library, you know, failed badly. The interesting thing was though, actually OpenSSL came out a, a little bit ahead of, of some of the uh, alternatives. Um, phase two goals, we split this into two different pieces. I'll just sort of go through this quickly. The TLS state machine, so the part of code that handles um, uh, current state on the wire, uh, major rewrite, the PKI constructions, uh, envelope, the EVP piece, uh, protocol flows, the core engine uh, got updated as well. Lots of changes to memory management, and then we also want to take a look at some of the core crypto implementations. To give you a sense of the scope, um, so this was the base when we, we really sort of dove in. Um, that's not exactly an accurate number because the Perl um, is Perl to generate assembler. These are highly optimized for, <coughs> excuse me, very specific uh, chipsets uh, for Intel and ARM. Um, very, very complicated code base. So what actually finally landed? Um, bio EVP, big number, core data structures. Uh, basically, if you're a developer or you're, you're some way integrating with the lib crypto, um, it, there was a, a pretty major API rewrite uh, that took place. Uh, Curl and uh, a couple of the other, um, you know, Apache and Nginx, uh, they all got uh, updates and they've been integrated as well. Um, what was removed, so SSL v2 just doesn't exist anymore. Uh, the export grade encryption uh, uh, cipher suites have been dropped. Now, interestingly, they actually dropped the FIPS 142 uh, module. That's a big deal. It's a big deal if you're Oracle or Microsoft or Amazon or, you know, Cisco or any of the larger companies that deal with the federal government or DOD or industry that potentially touches PCI, uh, PCI and so on. Um, it, it's probably two to three, four hundred thousand dollars and it's a major effort. Um, so for the one one what release, is? FIPS has been dropped, but um, I do understand there's, uh, um, it's been... Uh, what, what part of it is the two hundred thousand dollar effort? To, to, get, uh, to get an independent review to validate a new FIPS library. Yeah. Right. It's, it's a major investment of time. Uh, and then RC4 was removed from the default cipher suites. It's still there, you can specify, but you've got to opt into it now. Um, and then lots of other um, sort of modern goodies too. So uh, some pieces for hardware crypto encryption, uh, or, sorry, acceleration, uh, the pipelining threading API, a couple of the newer constructions that I mentioned, the Cha-Cha Poly, but basically if you're launching uh, you know, uh, Red Hat or Ubuntu or, uh, well, you know, most of the open source distros, you're not going to see these kind of um, in the ecosystems for a while. Some of the edge systems, uh, uh, the edge development versions uh, like um, Alpine Linux, which is the sort of new host uh, OS for Docker, um, just switched to, to LibreSSL, and so they'll see some of these. 
Um, but, but basically, I think over the next 18 months or so, we'll start to see the you know, ma major um, uh, operating system distros uh, integrate these. And then uh, S-Crypt for uh, you know, password constructions and then the uh, 25, uh, 5, 1, 19 curve. Um, and the short version is we'll have a report out by the end of the month. Um, it's going to be uh, pretty comprehensive. Uh, I do want to say, though, the effort was not find every bug in OpenSSL. There's going to be a bug next week. There's going to be a bug in two months. There's going to be a bug in six months. That's how software works. The goal was can we improve constructions? Can we improve the memory management uh, piece? Can we look at whole classes of vulnerabilities? And I think the team did a, did a tremendous job, but you can uh, judge for yourself. As I said, this should be out by the end of the month. And I think with that, we'll open up for thoughts and questions. Yeah. Um, with certificate transparency, <coughs> how are you advising people to cut internal certs where they don't necessarily want the uh, domain name to be public because it's only used internally? Sure. So, so I'm, the, I'm going to repeat question. questions. Yeah. So the question is, um, for certificate transparency, how do you handle internal certs where you don't really want to publish the whole host name to a public log for everybody to see? Um, so that is... So the, the, sh the, shortest, the, the uh, shortest answer, if it works for your situation, is to not use public PKI to uh, secure internal connections, especially if you're talking about these internal services that are so secret you don't even want to show the host name. Uh, like maybe, you know, and that probably means you're managing the devices that are connecting to it, so you have some ability to use private PKI. I mean, part of the social contract of the web PKI is you get a ton of convenience uh, from being able to just pull on like what the whole world has decided to trust, and so part of what you give back to that is, you know, uh, of some visibility into your slice of it. But in terms of in terms of other options, you know, there's, there's a, the the two simplest ones um, are private PKI, but then also you you do have the option of using a wildcard certificate, which. You know, you really don't want to be maybe minting wildcard certificates willy-nilly, or for the you know the base of your domain like star.domain.com. But you know, if you are, uh, this might be the sort of thing that incentivizes you to maybe move some of your internal services to like internal.domainname.com, something like that, where a wildcard certificate is not as much of a security risk, but still affords you some of the privacy that you're looking for. Um, there is, in the certificate transparency spec, the idea of a technically constrained subordinate CA. Uh, if you like, have your own CA that's name constrained, you can do it. But if, if you can do that, you could probably do private PKI. The last thing to say about that is that there is uh, this, the idea of redaction, of essentially logging a certificate with part of the host name removed. But that is uh, not, it does not look like that's succeeding in seeing consensus and adoption. Um, so, for example, when Chrome, Chrome went through a big public decision-making process about, like, before they dropped the hammer on Symantec, uh, and we're going to start requiring certificate transparency for everything of, like, basically whether Chrome would support redaction as it was currently uh, partly spec'd out in the IETF. And for a variety of reasons, they decided not to do that. They were concerned that it would not basically, actually, it would undermine some of the guarantees they want to give domain owners about always being able to know what's issued for them. Um, they certainly were never going to support something like, you know, redacted.domainname.com, because that's just too big. Uh, and it also undermines the, the general data quality you get. So there's not a one straightforward, simple answer. It's a bunch of trade-offs. Um, but right now, you're basically stuck with, like, wildcards or private PKI. Or you decide that maybe I won't spend a lot of energy trying to keep my host name secret and move on. But those are sort of the options as they, as they stand. Yeah. Can I do assessments of cloud providers that our company uses? And one of our security requirements is that we not use wildcard search. And yet everybody does. Yeah. So, I mean, in general, right, like, what you want for your, for your certificates are to have the smallest surface area possible, right? You want just to have certificates that are out there that are val valid for, like, just the domain names that you use. And, and where each key, that's each certificate itself, 
ideally is covering a pretty small surface area because you want to make it so that if somebody steals that key, they only get to use it for a, as small an amount of stuff as possible. In practice, people get wildcard certs, people get like multi-domain certs. There's clearly a use case for those things. Um, but really what you want to get to is, is whatever you're doing, automate it. And in a lot of cases, hopefully, if you are getting to the point where you can automate your stuff, you're also getting to the point where maybe you don't need a wildcard. Where maybe, you know, as domain names are provisioned in your infrastructure, you're issuing certificates for them and you're renewing them automatically uh, without having to like remember every three years, oh crap, there's a major certificate that's expiring, or you find out after it's expired. Right? And so the more that you're automating, the more you're maturing how you do that stuff. And while that can be sophisticated for large infrastructure, if it's just like your own personal thing, you can get a cron job going with Let's Encrypt really easily these days. That should help. There's still occasionally going to be times when like a wildcard is needed if you really have like wildcard DNS and you do really fancy stuff. But you know, there are more options now than there have been for that sort of thing. I would also say that just in my experience, it's, it's often a security smell when I see wildcards in large organizations. A lot of times it, it's sort of, it's worth asking other questions. What is your governance? What is your, you know, what, what is your automation? You know, how is your orchestration working? If it's Bob has to do something every, you know, four months, that's probably not so great. And, and it's, it's often a symptom of some other issues. So. Did, did that, is that helpful or, okay. Uh, five minutes left. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Open SSL, launch, <coughs> so the question was, how is, does Open SSL one one compare to the Libre SSL project? Right. So Libre SSL was was forked from uh, one hundred one, um, and so Libre was uh, you know a project by the OpenBSD folks, and they've done incredible work, um, huge amount of refactoring. One of the problems, though, is it was a fork of that, and it's, it's, it's very difficult sort of tracking that at the same time. So in general, Libra's had, I think, a, f a few less uh, CVEs and vulnerabilities, but even in the last couple months, there have been some that tracked one-to-one. -one. I mean, the, the class of kind of uh, side channel attacks and, and just sort of terrible CBC constructions, uh, kind of the, the canonical screw-ups, are, you're not going to see anymore. Th these are, these are, you know, battle-hardened, scarred, um, you know, edge cases that that are often there for a reason. So, um, they've they've now diverged quite a bit. If you look at the the code bases, I mean, it's it it's it's a very very manual project. There is some communication and coordination, but but it's it's very informal. Um, but I will say that that Libra is seeing some penetration into into other um, you know other projects. Sure. So the question is, uh, is there any plan to audit all the CAs, especially given the recent <coughs> woe sign uh, set of failures and some outright deception that was, uh, that was covered? Um, so I, I encourage everybody to go read the Mozilla report uh, on woe sign and startcom. So just, this is just a few weeks ago now. Um, they published basically woe sign, it's a, a certificate authority. Uh, had been discovered to have been making what seemed just like a long series of mistakes over like a year and a half, and it, at least that's what's known. And so that finally, people started talking about that publicly, and then also started noticing that they seemed to have uh, tried to backdate some certificates to get around the SHA-1 deprecation deadline. Um, and so Mozilla uh, just basically like spent weeks researching everything they could about the certificates that WoSign had, had issued. And, they have this just this really very readable report. You don't have to be a PKI expert to appreciate um, what they did. And so that's one of, uh, every year or so, there's just like a major CA failure of some kind. Um, they don't usually get coupled with outright deception like this one was. But, uh, and all of these sort of prompt, well, this, they generally prompt like immediate punishment of some sort on the misbehaving CA. Um, but they, in this case, they actually even, it was so bad that uh, they actually punished the auditor, right? So all root CAs, in fact, do have to get audited by a third party, and they have to be audited to a set of standards called WebTrust. I think there's a couple of options that they can do. 
Um, and so they all have to submit all those audit reports, at least to the root programs. And since Mozilla runs a public root program, those things are, are often public. And so, I mean, that plus now, honestly, with certificate transparency, the community can do a lot more review. And, you know, that's, they do get audited. And, and, you know, you can certainly be like, well, call in a better auditor to do the job. And that's actually kind of what they did with WebSign. Because they, so the auditor there is, I think, Ernst & Young, Hong Kong. And so Mozilla was like, we no longer accept audits from <coughs> Ernst & Young, Hong Kong. That was just too, too flagrant, right? So there's not a perfect way to, like awesomely audit all the CAs all the time, but every time one of these mistakes happen, uh, the, the ecosystem gets t turns out to get a lot stronger, um, both just like in the local punishments, but also that those kinds of things that were happening that led to that that event, like are are much more deterred and much more paid attention to by both root programs and the public and. So, and WoSign is now going to be punished in part, like, if they want to get readmitted, they're going to have to submit everything to certificate transparency. So now, certificate transparency is getting stronger for everything. All right, so I, I don't know if that totally answers your question, but, yeah. So, uh, sorry, oh, sure, I sorry, yeah. <laughs> There is a coffee break outside. If you have any extra questions for the speakers, um, yep, we'll be around. Yeah, Thank you. Good. Thank you very much.